trying out new techniques to make your models pop like I am. In this interview with Craig Brotman, a master modeler, he will walk us through some awesome techniques to help us all improve our skills. His inspiring work can be found on his Facebook page, Craig's Modeling Corner. I'll post the link in the description below. Hi, I'm Darren from Moderare Techniques. Our YouTube channel produces how-to videos for the modeler, no matter their skill level. If you follow this video, you too will be inspired to create and learn many new techniques along the way. So without further ado, let's get started. Welcome Craig Brotman to Moderare Techniques, another quick interview on the back of the Craftsman Courtyard uh, interview series that I'm doing. So thank you for taking the time away from your family and your, your modeling bench to uh, talk with us today. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, it's been, uh, I've been looking forward to it. Obviously we, you and I spoke and caught up the other day and sort of went through a few things and that was quite exciting from my point of view to talk to a modeler, modeler of your caliber, that's for sure. So it was uh, uh, a lot of good fun. So obviously for, for everyone out there that may or may not know Craig, he's got a, a Facebook page and I'll put a link below so you can just uh, click directly into it. So Craig's Modeling Corner, so it's definitely well worth a, a look into some of the, the fine work that he's coming up with um, from a diorama point of view in both HO and now O scale. So... Craig, we'll have a bit of a – people that sort of don't know you, we won't delve too too deep into your background um, to bring too many skeletons out, so to speak, but um, sort of get a little bit of – so predominantly you're, you work in the tennis industry is my understanding, um, in particular the, the customising of tennis rackets and stringing rackets, which is quite close to my heart, so to speak. You know, when you and I spoke of, I had – family members that played play tennis not to, to the high level that that you that you did so to give the the listeners some sort of idea the the caliber of what you're doing there as well you string rack, rackets at the US Open the Masters Cup Sonny Erickson and that's just a few that I think in your biography that I found so um, this obviously this is a modeling video car so we won't go too much about uh, the tennis side of things because that could be something total uh, video cast in itself, I would think. So so obviously you know yourself away around the tennis court reasonably well, I would think, So, from back in the yeah. day. so I played as a junior, and uh, that evolved into racket stringing, and I started, whew, started traveling the tour about 30 years ago. Wow. Uh, taking care of the players' rackets. And, uh, I mean, it's an art. Uh, I think what's helped me be so – successful in that is that I did play and I understand the players needs and what they're saying when they can't really express it. Sure. Uh, but it's a grind. I mean, it's when you're at a tournament, you're standing 18 hours a day. Uh, you're the first one at a tournament and you're the last one to leave. Sure. The, uh, the racket customizing evolved from that. And basically what that is, is, Fitting a racket to how a player plays the game or their style. So basically, like the golfers get their clubs fitted. It's the same thing in tennis. Yeah, sure. It's just not as popular in tennis. Um, the top college players and the top pros, they all get it done. Yeah, yeah. Now, I read a, a quick biography somewhere with one of your offsiders. I can't remember his name. He sort of gave a little insight of Roger Federer that he was testing in either, I think, a new racket or a new type of strings where no one else could see what this what these strings were all about. So it was all very, obviously, in the development phase, very hush-hush. So it was, I thought that was quite an interesting insight to, to your industry and what it could be like, I suppose, that ultimately it's the the medium that's sending the ball back at great speed and spin and all that type of thing to the other, the other player, which is, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. probably one of the most important things I would think. So. Absolutely. I mean, if you're driving a Porsche or you have a Porsche, you're not going to put cheap tires on it. No. So, so as far as the rackets, these guys can hit with anything. It's, it all starts with a string. Yeah. yeah. Sure. And you got to be dead sure. on. I mean, tension, you know, um, if the player's playing at night or if they're playing during the day, the tension's going to vary. Yeah. Depending okay. on the conditions. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, definitely. As I said, it probably could make do a whole pod, uh, video cast just okay. on that, <laughs> how we string a racket. But, um, exactly. All right. So also read 
one of your most memorable tennis moments, I suppose, was uh, Federer v Agassi, the Masters Cup 2003, that obviously that was probably a lot earlier on in Federer's career, I would have thought. Um, tell me if I'm wrong, that you were sort of invited back to his after party, so I thought that was that was pretty cool. Wow, how did you dig that up? That's crazy. The internet. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, we were in Houston. It was the Masters Cup, which is the year-end championship. Um, Roger won it. I was the official stringer for the event. And uh, after he won it, he invited me and my ex-wife back to a party with him and his wife and his team. He gave me the racket that he won the tournament with, signed it. Wow. Um, I actually... It's funny. I actually gave that away to a buddy who collects tennis rackets. Wow. Um, Must be a good buddy. (laughs) I mean, it's just because I'm in that environment and I'm around those guys all the time. Sure. I can get stuff like that all the time. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I'd better have somebody that can appreciate it. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I'll have it. So, but yeah, that was a great, that was a great moment. Yeah. Okay. Is he a gentleman off the court as much as he is on the court? I'm assuming he is. So he is exactly how he is on the court. Yeah, he's that's definitely a role model for the for your sport. That's for sure. Yes, yes. He didn't grow up that way, though. No. Okay. He we won't up, go into uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's dive straight into the modeling side of things here. So tell sure. us about your your modeling background. Well. Um, I majored in architecture and interior design in college, went a couple years, um, didn't stay in college just because my mom had died before I started college and it just, sure. my head sure. wasn't there. Um, went into the tennis business and, uh, I grew up near Howard Zane. We grew up, I grew up a few streets away from him. So oh, I used to go over his yeah, house and see yeah. his layouts and stuff. And, uh, I started collecting fine scale miniature kits. Yep. And, uh, you know, I've had Campbell kits growing up, but I started building some fine scale kits. I used to go over to this guy's house back in Maryland one, one night a week, and he would build and I would build. And if I had an issue or if I needed to know how to do something, he would help me. Um, and then got divorced, moved to Atlanta really got out of the hobby, but I, I continued to buy the fine scale kits just because I love the detail of those kits. And I knew one day I would get back in the hobby. Just didn't sure. know when, sure. but I, I knew I'd get back into it. Um, cause I like working with my hands and that's, that comes back to stringing the rackets and customizing sure. tennis sure. rackets. Sure. Um, moved to Atlanta probably a year or two after I moved back to Atlanta. Um, I met my girlfriend, Trish, and uh, for my birthday, she would always ask, what do you want? And I would say, I want the new fine scale miniature kit. And about three years ago, she said, uh, what do you want for your birthday? And I said, another kit. She's like, no more, no more. Um, you're either going to start building these or we're going to get rid of your collection. So she sent me to the Craftsman Expo in Albany, New York. For my birthday. Wow. And that was like a five or six day event. And it was just the top modelers. Yeah. And I got to meet a lot of people. And my goal goal going there was to come back either wanting to get back in the hobby or, or not. Sure. And uh, sure. I just sat there and I just studied everybody. I mean, I sat and watched, you know, Jack from Bar Mills. I watched Ron. I watched Todd from Fuscale. Um, You know, I met Brett and Todd. Oh, actually, Todd. Brett wasn't sure. there. Sure. And I just studied the models in the contest room, and it got me pumped up. And I yep. came home and built one of these cheap $19 Fuscale kits I had in storage, and uh, it just took off from there, and I've been building ever since. That's fantastic. So. Previously, you've mentioned on you, you, you mentioned Todd, obviously, of yep. uh, Todd and Brett Wiley, the the HO scale custom fame. 
um, I think it was on there that I listened to you that you're not really into the railway side of things, um, so to speak. So I'm quite interested into that journey there because obviously, so, so tell us about you've gone into model railroad custom or craftsman kits, I should say, um, and someone that just likes to build models. Is it just purely because you're obviously the architecture background that you have that you enjoy building the buildings, so to speak, and then building the scene um, and the trains uh, are not even on your, on your scale, on, on, in your, in your site, so to speak. It's just purely the architecture and the scene that you can build around that. I, I guess that is a big part of it. The other part is I live in a two bedroom apartment. I don't have the space for a layout. And I'm so detail oriented. You've seen my work. Yeah, beautiful. I, uh, beautiful. I can't possibly f- fathom how I could do that sure. on a layout. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely something that I struggle because uh, I've just recently got into the fine scale miniature side of things, um, where. Some of the details, like including yourself, are uh, putting into these models, and you've seen some photos of, of my layout that there's absolutely no way I'd be able to, in this lifetime, give that amount of attention to it. So that's sort of a, a struggle of my modelling at this point in time. And it's, you know, everyone's got their own struggles regarding their modelling, whether it's not enough space, too much space, or something in between if you're building a layout, so to speak, that sure. I'm trying to. <clears throat> build these these kits to to a good enough level that that it's never going to surpass of something like like yourself because you did you're ultra ultra detailing these these items for a diorama scene so to speak. Yeah, I, I mean, I look at the dioramas I did 20, 20 years ago when I started buying the fine scale kits. The detail was there on the structure, but the scenery is nowhere near. I mean, it's changed, you know? I mean, Woodland Scenics is still around and, you know, they still make great products. George is the only one that I know that can really use their products and make it look so well done. Yeah. Uh, Mine just looks like a bunch of clumps on top of dirt. (laughs) Back then. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, now with, obviously, we've talked about this, the Martin Welberg products. Sure. uh, I mean, it's just, it's taken scenery to a different level. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So we'll get to, definitely get to talking about him in a sec. Um, Sure. So on your Facebook page, I've noticed, and I'll just bring that page up. So Sure. And we'll start with the top of my list is you, you're quite well versed, and I think you can see that the, the website for AK. Uh huh. Yep. So you're quite well versed in, and you, you speak quite openly about the, the use of of these products, and you're willing to basically try anything to to further further your modelling. So, um, I suppose the the first thing that pricked my mind, um, a post you put up recently, are the the third generation acrylics from AK. So um, yeah. I'm, we'll just go into standard colors. It doesn't really matter, um, yeah. so to speak. So I read a, a little blurb recently on AK because I showed you a, a rather large ship build I did uh, that I used uh, an airbrush. So I, I do some modeling with airbrushing. And before that, I've used Vallejo paints, which I thought okay. were... The, the top of the market, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Probably they, you know, they they're obviously up there. But what I did find, yeah. and I'm willing to give the AK and third. I have the Vallejo paints. Yeah. I use them. I use them. Yeah. So, and these are the the airbrush versions. Um, no, actually, actually, these third edition AK paints are steered towards the brush. You right. can use airbrush. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, using a brush, you're supposed to not have brush marks sure sure but also did read somewhere um that's something you you put up or during when i I was uh, researching this that 
and it's an inherent problem with an airbrush is because it's such a fine nozzle, it it does clog up quite regularly depending on the atmosphere around you and the weather conditions. So and that's one thing that the AK third third generation are saying that they're probably not totally eliminated, but something that's been addressed with this this side of the paint. So that's- I'm I'm quite excited to to give them a go to see if that that actually is the case because that could be a game changer for a lot of people that use airbrushes, I would think. So I just got in 12 bottles of the paint. I ordered from them in Spain. I haven't really played with them enough yet. Um, And it's funny you're talking about airbrushing because I have an airbrush, a Badger 150 from, I don't know, 15 years ago, 18 years ago. And I broke it up yesterday. I want to start airbrushing castings and stuff like that. Um, and it's missing a part. So I want to get back into airbrushing. Um, and I was talking to Jake Johnson today and mm-hmm. stuff like that, about airbrushing, sure. just trying to learn. I mean, I've done yeah. it a couple of times. It's been so long, but when I did it, it was with local paints, yeah. the lacquer based paints. And yeah. it, was, you know, it was a nightmare cleaning it. And, yeah. and I don't want to bother with that. So no. I've I've got quite a number of local paints as well uh, from back in the day, and probably not as many as what you've got. But obviously, you can't get them anymore. Um, but that is the big issue: is they're quite quite toxic and noxious <laughs> when when yes, you're spraying you can, them. You can still get them. Yeah. You can still get them. Oh, you can still get them. Oh, excellent. Uh, so yeah, but but I, I prefer those. Paints. I like those paints. Yeah, local. Just don't like the fumes. No, that's right. And then yes. Yeah. <laughs> For the airbrush, it's, it's, right. they are quite hard to clean the brush afterwards. But you know, yeah. whatever, whatever, whatever you want to do. So, yep. um, okay. Also, I've seen. So recently, that's coming up on screen now is the the new O scale kit that you're building, um, okay. which is refresh my memory. Who builds this one? It's Foggy Mountain. Foggy, it's Foggy Mountain, that's model. right. That's correct. The pilot model that I'm doing for them. Yeah. So you did some um, some lovely, what we call in Australia, 44-gallon drums, I suppose, or? 55-gallon. 55, 55 over, over your part of the world. Um, so a little, <laughs> bit, little bit bigger than ours. <laughs> yeah. So you did used, uh, where are we? You use the pencils, um, yeah. which is something I definitely want to th- that I yeah. definitely want to get into. Um, so, talk us through the the evolution of the pencil and how how did you use those? So, these drums were basically the first time I really used the pencils. Uh, I haven't played with them much, but I bought the kit when they came out. Um, what I did is you tip the end or you dip, I'm sorry, you dip the end into water and you can actually apply it like paint. Right. Okay. So, so all I did was dip, uh, three or four different colors of the, uh, the rust into water and started just dabbing it on and then took a brush with a little bit of water on it and sure. just, uh, you know, moved it around. And I, I like the way it came out. Yeah. I've got I've got a, a photo of them on the you know there's yep. three there the one with a little oily rag that's sitting on the side yeah. that is just lovely so um, how do you think because obviously that's O scale how do you think that would come across the detail because I've never built an O scale but tell me if I'm wrong but the attention to detail on O scale you can add a lot more detail just purely because it's twice the size effectively um, and this is my first O scale sure it's fun. It's fine. You can definitely show more detail. Sure. Um, and I actually reached out to one of the guys at AK who lives in, I think, uh, Portland or on the West Coast and was asking him about that. Sure. And uh, you're going to have to play with it. So I will Yeah. Um, on some barrels. Lovely. So I, I see yeah. that AK appear to be more – military model driven i think um are they looking at coming across to this niche because obviously you're you're bringing i think there's so much we can learn from the military models modelers out there because some of the 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 modeling they're doing is second to none it's just 
words don't can't explain how good these modelers are. Um, so obviously the AK it appears to be, you know, even in their logo, it's got a, an assault rifle, so to speak. Um, is there, are they looking at coming across into the, the model rowing that, that you could see? or they, they do want to break into it. If you go back to that page that you just had up before. That one? Uh, of the diorama. Yeah. Yep. So that technique on the ground came from a military modeling guy that I've built a relationship with here right. in Atlanta. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And that's, uh, I think you and I, we briefly spoke about that. That's uh, like a sculptor mold. Yeah. 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 Uh, tinted with chocolate brown acrylic paint. Sure. And then sprinkle a little dirt on. Yeah. We're in the model train world. We we apply acrylic paint a color. Yeah. And then we cover it with dirt. Sure. And that color hides whatever space you miss. Right. Um, so once you apply the dirt, you let it dry, and then you come back with yeah. a paintbrush with the glue and water, 50-50, sure. Sure. and just paint it on. Yeah. Okay. And then once that dries, I give it a, a, bl a brown-black oil wash, and that highlights around the rocks and everything. Sure. sure. Once that dries, then I come back with four different shades of tan, starting with dark to the yeah. lightest, and yeah. dry brush the whole ground. Okay. So it's a lot of work. Yeah. I can't imagine doing it on a layout, but on no. a diorama. It's quite interesting because I, I sort of, you know, we, we spoke about, I sort of make my own sculptor mold. Um, be interesting to try that technique even on a layout. Sure. Because um, I, I, I think you could, even if you're not using the the depth of color and the amount of colors you're that you know four or five colors that you've suggested that that that's on that particular diorama, I think I'm I'm guilty of this as well. So you'll put your sculptor mold down, which I'll add a little bit of talus to around my my rocks and the like that that you and I yeah. spoke about, and then yeah. I think to then I'll then go back and just put as you say dirt over the top of it, which is real world size dirt unless you sieve it right down through various right. screening sizes, I think that has a lot of merit because I think even if you just use two colours, you could dry brush that up reasonably quickly in a large area, I would think. So that's something I definitely want to give a try or give a go, I should say. Yeah, so the key is make sure you seal the dirt with the glue and water. Sure. Before you come back with an oil wash yeah. and dry brush it. Okay. Because the oil is just going to sink straight in, I would think, the, the, okay. the carrier medium. Yeah. Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. But the military stuff does carry over. They look sure. at what we do and we look at what they do. And yeah, um, I think their probably emphasis is more on the base of a diorama, you know, the ground effect. Sure. And that's what I really wanted to get into. I yeah. love the scenery part of a diorama now. Yeah. So did you, after you and I spoke the other day, did you have a chance to go and look at um, Joseph Brandle's scenery at all? I did, I did not. No. I did not have oh, a chance. Yeah. Uh, one website I forgot to bring up. Uh, and obviously this is not, uh, where are we? Here we go. So I'm not advocating any any sort of business here. I've just brought up uh, the next sort of medium that you seem to love to use is pan pastels. So how did you get into those, I suppose? So I have a buddy here, Robert Scoby, who's a phenomenal model builder. Sure. Uh, he used to be an HO. He's sold his whole HO collection years ago and moved up to O scale. Yep. And uh, met him on Facebook. Turns out we live in the same area in Atlanta. Went over his house and he uses pan pastels and he told me about it. And uh, I bought a few, but I'm the type, I don't just stick to a few. I buy every color, sure. basically. Sure. So, uh, and I started playing with them and they're just so easy. I, I mean, I use, you know, the chalks that we all use in the hobby and yep. the pasta, yep. uh, Bragdon pastel, you know, chalks. Sure. Um, I use them. There's certain times I need them. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the pan pastels, 
I like the control that you have with them. If you sure. put too much on, yeah. you just take an eraser and you wipe it off. Yeah, okay. Where yeah. if you put Bragdon's on too much, you're basically in trouble. That's it. Okay. So, so fit fit for purpose, what we would call it in this part of the world. So um, they obviously they're a very very a lot finer powder. Would that would that be fair to say? Like the yeah. actual medium yeah. seems to be a lot finer and a higher pigment pigment ratio, I suppose you would say. Um, yeah. And I was on a, a Zoom last night with a bunch of model railroad guys and they were asking how I apply it. They do make uh, these like makeup sponges to apply it. I just use a paintbrush, different right. size brushes to apply it. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. All right. Hunter line stains was another one that I see predominantly uh, and I've just lost their website. So I never, I'd never heard of hunter line stains. I've heard obviously staining, staining wood and the like um, before I, I took my journey down with the, the HO scale customs gents, yep. which is where I heard about them. So I used to mix my own stains, so to speak. So um, I've since branched out into Indian ink and isopropanol stain. So yeah. Why hunter line stains for you? Um, yet again, another product. I'm assuming. Tell me if I'm wrong. Would is fit for purpose for what it's doing. So why why do you like hunter line stains so much? Um, they just have so many different variations of colors. I use them. I don't use them all the time. Sure. Um, I use in the ink and alcohol, like you spoke about. Um, I actually use Copic pens which is an alcohol-based pen that you can get at any of the art supply stores. Sure. sure. And I've colored wood siding with that. Right. Okay. I mean, like you heard on the HO Customs podcast, I don't like every diorama to look the same. Sure. So sure. I'm always sure. using different products right. to create yeah. a different look or a different finish. Okay, that's. Um, I've just put up their website now, and I don't know if you can see yeah. that. And just, it's not modeling yeah, that, we're, that we're into, but that looks fantastic. Um, yeah, they're out of Canada, but right now yeah. they're they're not able to ship. I think because yeah. the run on alcohol. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Virus, so. Be interesting to see if I'd be able to ship that to Australia when all this schmozzle dies down with the alcohol. I'm assuming I would be able to. So. Yeah. I mean, well, here in the states, they have a. Uh, warehouse in Maryland, right? But okay. I, they might have warehouse. I don't know. They might be tied in with other yeah, places. Yeah, definitely giving a go. So yeah, yeah. Well, but their lovely. stuff's nice. Yeah, I can. As I said, I've never, never come across it before until t taking on this journey, and it's definitely would like to give them a go. That's for sure. Particularly that driftwood color. That's that's a very. I've struggled to get that that color correct to my eye anyway so well we all used to like back in the day using floquil driftwood yeah that was okay. that was the driftwood the go-to uh, sure yeah. and i have a couple bottles so i still use it yeah uh, but i have some floquil gray colors that i use sure yeah all right uh martin wilberg yeah. Um, I don't know how to describe this man. <laughs> He's off the charts. So I'll, I'll bring up his Facebook page quickly. Um, yeah. Martin Wilberg Scenic Studios. So I know that you had the pleasure of doing a little bit of work or a, a workshop with him, I suppose, um, of recent times. So how did sort of that, how did that eventuate? So I have seen some of his products. I don't remember where. Maybe it was on Scenic Express, uh, their website. Um, ordered some, played around with it, didn't know how to use them properly. And uh, I love building relationships with people and sure. meeting new people. So I sent him a Facebook private message. Okay. I didn't expect him to respond, uh, but I sent him a message that I had just gotten some of his products. I'm looking forward to using it. Uh, and from there, we just kept talking through Messenger. Sure. And then 
back in September, I think, of last year, he sent me a Facebook message and he said, he asked me if I was going to be at the narrow gauge event in Sacramento. And sure. I said, I wasn't. Yeah. He said he was doing a clinic out there for Jim from uh, Scenic Express that he was going to be in Atlanta on its way back for a week. Let's try to connect. And I'm like, that's awesome. I'd love it. You know, I mean, who wouldn't? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, that when he was in Sacramento, he sent me a message and he said, uh, I'm going to be in Smyrna, Georgia. Do you know where that is? And I sent him back a message. Yeah, I live in Smyrna. <laughs> What's the chances, right? Even better. Yeah. So, uh, he's like, great. When I get in, I'll give you a shout and we'll get together. Sure. And I hadn't done the scenery on that Cartwright's build yet. I hadn't yeah. finished it. Yeah. And I was holding off for him sure. to help me. So uh, he came into town. I picked him up at his cousin's house who he was staying with. And he spent like two, three hours in my apartment. Wow. And it was, I mean, it was a private, you know, uh, scenery class for wow. me. Wow. Yeah. It was amazing. Like I've got uh, one of these photos that yeah. really popped into mind. That just that, that whole scene, you know, it's probably only a few inches by a few inches, I would think, um, zoomed in. But I think us layout guys, I'll call us in inverted commas, probably need to get into this side of things because I'm assuming what I've found and tell me if I'm wrong with what, what he's, he taught to you is when we do a, do a structure, it's all about the layers. I can't see scenery being any different. It's just a different medium and it's flat on the ground, so to speak. So, um, so it's just a matter of building those layers, building, building, building till you get to, uh, you know, an awesome looking, um, scrubby scene like that, that we're seeing on the screen there. It's all layers. Yeah. That's what I like. Yep. And the other thing is he taught me how to use my camera on my iPhone right. to take the pictures. Okay. So talk so us through yeah. that. What sort of technical tips did he, because obviously I use my iPhone predominantly for everything, um, including my my little how-to videos is all done on my iPhone. So, I mean, he just showed me how to take up close-ups and how to look at the scene before sure. I actually finish it through the eyes of a lens. You know, typically when we do scenery, we just put it down and we look at it. Sure. It looks different through a phone. Yeah. Or through a camera. Yeah, sure. And that picture right there, that's taken on an iPhone, I'm sure. Yeah, they they take lovely photos. Uh, I'm very happy with mine. i got iPhone 10, so. Yeah. Um, and the, <laughs> the 11th version or 11th evolution is much better again, apparently, in cameras. Yeah, but, yeah I'd be 11, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the experience to have him come over, I would put it in the same category, obviously, as if Doug came over from Foscale or yeah. George and just watch them do structures and, uh, you know, weathering. Yeah. No, it's definitely uh, – that's lovely scenery. You know, I'd, I'd put him in the league as I – you know, you know – you and I spoke about one of my influences, uh, Joseph Brando, a German gentleman, and I'd put these two in the same same sort of league with the their landscaping skills. Yeah, yeah. That's just lovely. So you you touched on Woodland Scenics products before. Um, uh -huh. I think and I think we've all used used their products, and they're quite lovely to work with. I still enjoy using them, but. Have you tried some of the European products? Now, the one that I use is Mina Nature or Silfa. Um, yeah. I quite enjoy using using those as well, and they seems to be this sort of vein um, that, that Martin has got here by the looks of it. So, Yeah, I, I use their products. I have some. Yep, I like them. Typically from Woodland Scenics, I'll use their uh, Murky Water. That's sure. what I use, I think. Cartwright's yeah. diorama. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. We'll we'll jump into into those side of things. I think so. All 
All right. All right, so what we'll do now, we'll go through pictures of now. So the builds here that we're looking at for for the uneducated like myself, so I keep reminding myself. So we're looking at Cartwrights and Elijah Roth and Sons. So there's two different builds. There's just different aspects that I enjoyed looking yep. at and I'm sort of wanted to pick your brain. So this first one, in my understanding, that, that's Cartwright. Um, yep. and we'll, we'll get to the, the end photos um, at the end of the slideshow. So just talk us through, I suppose the first thing I, I, I'm interested in is do you, when you compose your scene and your diorama, do you go, you know, you've already made mention that you've got a number of FSM kits sitting ready to go, so to speak. Do you go, okay, I want to build that one. Do you look at, okay, building the building first, or do you have some sort of idea how the diorama is going to play out? So what I'm trying to trying to get out there, obviously when we build Model Railway, it's bench board, then the track, and then the scenery to a certain yeah. degree is almost a little bit of an afterthought um, for, for some people anyway. Some people go right into it. Or do you look at, okay, I want to build cart rights. Um, this is the type of scenery I'm going to do with this. Or is that – so the composition of the scene, how do you go about doing that? So basically on car rights, all I did was build it exactly how the scene was built for the prototype that George Oh, I made. see. Okay. Yeah. I see. Yep. Same thing with Elijah. Same thing. Sure. Um, and then for this O scale, I mean, I basically just turned it a little bit of an angle um, and just did some contour of the groundwork. Sure. That was it. Okay. I, I'm not good yet at creating a diorama scene. Right. I can copy a scene. Sure. But that's the next part I want to start focusing on yeah. is creating different scenes. Sure, sure. Okay, excellent, excellent. All right, so we'll look at this this first photo. So this is, besides going through, making sure all the parts, and this is sort of, you know, one of the first steps, obviously, is colouring up. Uh, the, the wall pieces. Uh, we'll get to staining the wood in the background and that shortly. Um, so what, what's, looking at that photo there, what is the first, obviously you've coloured the, the sides up. So what, what colour is that to start with, I, I suppose? So this, was actually, this kit was actually started 17 years ago. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, and all I do is, first step is uh, prime the wood, the wall siding with local driftwood or a gray. You can use a gray acrylic. Sure. And then that's boxcar red. Right. From Flocal okay. on right. top. Okay. And that's just brushed on? That's brushed, brushed on. on. But, yeah. But what I did is I always went back to the thinner and sure. dipped the brush in it yeah, to get okay. the variations yeah. in color. Oh, uh, okay. Yep. I can see that there on the 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 bottom edge there so that's definitely one color of flow i do have a lot of because that's in my part of the world when i was building resin kits yep um yep. it's quite a prominent color um for, yep. for what i'm doing yep. as well so okay now obviously you're a proponent for some buildings for the nail holes i, I think it's i don't have a uh, is it a pounce wheel i don't have one of those yeah. yet but it's definitely on yep. my my yep. my kit to do so what um technique do you use to because my my fear would be that i would have you know you're trying to do vertical lines but mine would end up going off 45 degree angle and ruin the model effectively so how do you do that i've done that <laughs> i've gone <laughs> I've, I've veered off yeah. um yeah i mean you basically just run the roller straight down run the ponce wheel at an angle so it doesn't vary off and then just run it straight up sure that's sure. it i mean it's not that difficult, but no. it's easy to, to mess it up. Yeah. So you draw a very faint line to start with by the looks of it, which obviously helps I you. Draw, I draw a, a hash mark at the top yep. and a hash mark at the bottom and then just yep. run the roller. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I used to do, and I can't find the tools, I just used to have a straight pin type thing. Right. And I would put in each hole. Oh, uh, okay. Wow. I don't know. Old school. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely something I want to get into, and obviously <laughs> the Wiley boys have got their 
they've got their t-shirt. Sorry? There's that debate about nail hole. Yeah. Should you put a <laughs> nail hole or not to nail hole, that is the question. So anyway. I, I like the look of it. Yeah. Just it gives a character. I mean, sure. It, it, it is like people have said, Martin Welberg's scenery on my dioramas is out of scale. Yeah, it probably is on HO. Yeah. But to the eye, it just brings that whole scene together. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the, you know, the battle all us scale modelers have, I suppose, to, to integrate the, you know, the real world to what we're trying to do and make everything look as realistic as we can. And it's, it's impossible to keep everything to scale because, you know, first of all, the, the area that we're building these models in are not to scale. So there's a lot of poetic license or artistic license, I suppose, that we've got to apply. And, um, it's quite an interesting, you know, whole discussion. I, I'm writing an article for a, an article, sorry, an article for a, a magazine right now, an e-magazine that it basically talks about from a, a layout point of view, people's perceptions of what they call the rivet counters all the way through to a, a freelancer like myself that puts anything, as long as it looks looks good and it looks half reasonable, I'll build it type thing. So it's quite an interesting uh, concept that uh, or discussion just behind that point, what, yep. you know, what people perceive and, you know, that's obviously their opinion. If they want to have that, it's fine. But sure. um, as long as it do doesn't become destructive and that's what the premise right. of this, this article is, as long as we're all helping each other along, I think that's, that's what it's about. Yep. Yep. I agree. So, Bracing is something very new to me. Um, obviously, I've only built, you know, a handful of Craftsman kits, nothing to this size as yet. Um, I'm sort of slowly getting up to something of this size. Now, bracing and warping of the walls is obviously a big issue. Um, so talk us through your bracing because I see you've, you've done some staining on the back there. I've, I've seen a technique, I think, uh, via Jason Jensen where he uh – -huh on occasions stains both sides to sort of counteract that warp. Is that something you're finding or is there yeah, another I mean, reason why you're – That's what you're, I did here. Right. It's stained both sides. Yep. Okay. Yep. So on top of that boxcar red, I actually put the alcohol and India ink. Sure. And then I came back on the backside and yep. alcohol and India ink and then brace yep. it. Okay. So it doesn't but look – a lot of Go bracing on, on that. Um, obviously, uh, you, you follow the instructions. Like I don't know where I must go overboard with my bracing. So I'm I'm interested in the, the whole bracing concept. Yeah, um, I mean sometimes I do go overboard. Depends sure. on the wall yeah. section. Right. Okay. So obviously these are quite high walls, and once you start cutting segments out for windows and all that, obviously it adds some sort of weak point in inverted commas, I suppose. To that point. These are, uh, already cut out the windows. I didn't yeah. have to cut those. Yeah, okay. I've done that on a very little scratch build that I, I wanted to throw myself into and yeah, it's <laughs> to get them straight is quite interesting. Yeah. When you've got to cut them, so Yeah. Okay. Um now we talked briefly on pan pastels before. Now I think on Facebook you mentioned Pan pastels on this part of of this build is that my yeah. get yeah so obviously you can see them in the blurry blurred background you you've got all your pan pastels so talk us through obviously the nail holes are there this is a little bit further along in the build of course and I do apologise for getting out of sequence here a little bit but it's just something I because I did I so did. above the concrete slab on the bottom where the boards are lifted yeah I came back with a little brush and a dark grey sure and just put in the dark gray pan pastel. Yeah. Just so your eye goes there. Sure. Sure. And then where the nail holes are, yeah. I ran pan pastels from the top down. Right. So okay. it would get in the holes and then yeah. erased it on the sides. Yeah. Okay. That was a question I'm going to ask is how you highlighted those. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think I need to get some of these pan pastels. I've looked on the, the website that you suggested uh, as a dick blick or something similar. Uh, over here, yeah. so and he, I've emailed him, um, and they've got back to me, and they definitely ship still shipping to my part of the world. So, 
Yeah. Um, and even with shipping, they're not too badly priced, I don't think. So I think they're five or six American dollars. So Yeah, yep. Which is better than what I can get them over here, that's for sure. Gotcha. Okay. Talk us through, so the the door and window preps. How, how do you go about doing that? As far as the coloring? Uh, well, so you've... Okay, so maybe just the you, you get the say the the window structure out of the box. It's pristine. Yep. How do you yep. start? How do you start? So let's start from the very beginning, I suppose, with them. So, so, so the first thing I do is I clean all the castings sure. with soap and water, uh, and then prime them. And I think these were primed just with a rattle can, yeah, gray uh, auto body primer, yeah, it's cheap primer. Yeah, that's, and then that's what I'll back. use. Yeah, that's typically what we all use in the hobby. And yeah. then I came back with a brush and uh, brushed the boxcar red on sure. and thinned it in certain spots sure. uh, to get variation. And then I always dry brush. The dry brushing is right. the most important, I think, yeah. technique. We all sure. can master. Yeah. So it just makes everything pop. Now, dry brushing, um, I've brought up down a little bit further, but it's quite interesting you bring that up now. So, I obviously you're a, a huge proponent of of it, and it's and it's it's a skill that I'm starting to learn. Of just as just this morning, I was playing around with some jetty scenes that I'm I'm building uh, for a harbour area that I'm just playing with dry brushing. So, is there any sort of little tricks for young players or the brush size, the brush type? Um, I mean, I, with dry I just brushing. use a basic brush. Yeah. What I do is I dip it in the paint, wipe it on a paper towel. Sure. And then I'll take the brush on my hand. Yeah. And if it shows up a lot on my hand, then I just keep wiping it keep off. Till there's, yeah, yeah, that's all I do. Now. You can always go back and put layers of it on. Correct. But you can't take it off. So. Can't take it off, yeah. Is there any particular direction that you go with the dry brushing? Um Obviously, because um, the dry brushing is you're trying to pick up all the highlights of a given area, so you sort of work it in different different angles yeah. to try to try yeah. to get that, or you work in one angle, or yeah. For the windows, I'll start from the top down, yeah, and then I'll go to the sides, and I'll just move it around. Yeah. Okay. I'll just move the piece around. Yeah. Okay. So, what uh, windows and doors was that build from? So this is from Cartwright. That's Cartwright. Okay. Yeah. So they're all these castings came with a kit. Okay. So they're metal castings, are they? Some they of are. them. Oh, even the no, windows. All... Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's phenomenal. All right. So whilst we're talking about castings, it's I think that's one aspect that I first fell in love with your side of things is the castings. So these are obviously very high level, high end castings. That what I can see. I'm no expert at it. So, um, yeah. talk us through. Okay, so we got the little drums and that. I think this is pretty early on in the in the process. So you get the casting, yeah. you'll clean it up to get any burrs off. So what is yeah. then the next step? So any casting that is basically a wood type uh, casting, yeah, a palette or a crate. I'll spray them like a a khaki color, a right. tan. Okay. And then anything else, I basically give it a, a gray sure. primer. And then I come back and paint them. Uh, if it's a palette, I'll just come back. And uh, first thing I do after the castings have dried, I come back and I give every casting an alcohol and Indian dark wash. Sure. And then I'll dry brush the palettes or the crates with like an antique white or something. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've, hey, I've had a lot of success, I think. Um, I haven't tried the tan or khaki yet um, for the undercoat, so to speak, but I, I'll definitely want to give that a go. But the Union Wink ink wash just seems to just bleed nicely into to the nooks and crannies that you, it's impossible to get into any other way effectively. But yeah. So yeah. I've, I've found that to be quite a successful technique that I've used um, in my... It's life. funny, that technique 
is an old technique. Yeah. It hasn't it hasn't changed. Yeah. People are using it. So I think we've got more castings here. So these castings are just gorgeous. They really are. Um, I sort of hence why we're interested in. So obviously we, we've already touched on. I think this is the next next sort of step where you've come back in and you've done a little your fibril, your first part of a dry brush, um, where you can see the the bleeding out of the Indian ink. So you've, you've done all that. Yeah, yeah. So that looks. So what do we got next? So just more, obviously, then it's just it appears by these photos, if you can see them, you're just building, building, building those those colours into it. Um, yeah. Um, so you always just use the antique white right off the right off the bat or do you start with, you know, a darker, tanny car keys and then sort of just build the colour that way or you just... No, I, I typically just start with the antique white. Wow, okay. So, yeah. yeah. And then if I have to, I'll vary it with the pan pastels. Yeah, yeah. Do you then go back in, say, you've got this little, hard to see what that is, a, a crate, I suppose, down the bottom sort of here. Do you then go back in and touch colours up there or you just sort of, you don't get to that 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 level of detail? No, I do. I do. do. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. So I'm assuming with that you then look at, okay, that looks, say, like a, a hammer or something, um, and then you'll pick up, okay, this I want these hammers or these tools to look this colour, and then you sort of integrate yeah. those, those colours into it. Okay. I mean, I basically pick a few colours out. You know, sure. it might be olive green. It might be a blue. It might be a shade of burgundy or red. Sure. And then some greys and some browns, and that's my palette. Right. And then I just... Go in it, you know, and a silver if you have a wrench or something. And sure. I just fetch sure. those castings up. Ah, uh, okay. So I'm not that far off the track then. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. This isn't a fun part. Uh, here we go. I mean, here we go. That's the, yeah, this is exactly yeah. what I'm talking about here. So, yeah. all right. So that trash can to the left. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Has a soda bottle in there that's painted yeah. green. Yeah. I've, funny you say that, I've painted that exact casting. Um, I got a, from Jimmy Dignan. So obviously uh -huh. he's he's got all the castings now, doesn't he? So um, yeah. that was quite fun. That was a lot of fun. So yeah. it doesn't look as good as that one there, but I gave it a, gave it a shot. So it's definitely one thing I want to get into because I think, as we'll talk about later on, it's just the castings in these these types of little, what I call finite detail, I think uh, as important, if not more important than some of the structures themselves, if that makes sense, because it just adds the, the lived-in aspect to it and this is a you know operating sawmill or, or whatever that, that you're yeah. trying to model. I totally agree, yeah. So, so we've got away from the castings, so... Uh, we'll go to corrug what we in Australia call corrugated iron or iron roofing uh, sheets. So yeah. this is for a little annex on Cartwrights. No, no, this is Elijah's, isn't it? The, the annex, I think, for this one. So yeah, it was. Um, I have done quite a number of iron roofing, and I'm quite happy with sort of the results I'm getting. I've tried uh, shingle roofs. And yep. I'm no good at shingle roofs, but I've since spoken to Ron Klaus or Klaus, I should say, yep. and he's pointed me to a little uh, little clinic he did on his website. So I'm I'm looking forward to getting in into giving that a go with a how he how he paints them up. So how do you, in regards to to the picture on screen, yeah, how do you go about doing your corrugated or your iron sheeting to look so realistic like that? So the first thing I do is I prime everything with like a, a light gray. Sure. Uh, and then I'll take a couple raw lumber, raw sienna, an okra, okra yeah. color, yeah. and I'm just sponging it on. Yeah. And then I'm, yeah, those are the colors yeah. right there. Yeah. And then I'll come back with the uh, Bragdon pastels. Right. Uh, sometimes, sometimes while the paint is still wet, 
Sure. I'll mix the pastel in with it. Yep. So it gives yep. it a crusty texture. Okay. But uh but on this O scale diorama, you know, the whole structure is corrugated aluminum. Right. I use okay. I use the acid on that because I wanted it to really eat away at the corrugated aluminum. Oh, I see. Okay. So that sheeting there is that is that cardstock? Um I or was that actual that is, aluminum or metal sheet, so to speak? That is actually the aluminum sheets. Okay. But I've I used the paper. Yeah. I like the paper. Okay. Because yeah. I've just, there's a, a chap here in Australia that has just recently, I just stumbled across it. So I'm looking forward to getting his sheets. And they come in sort of like a, an, a standard A4 sort of, yep. you know, printer paper sheet that you can just cut quite easily with a hobby knife. So I'm looking forward to giving that a go. And I've got, some of the the cardstock sheeting from uh, Jeff Grove as well, so yeah. I want to give that a go. So he sent some shingles through with a build that I I did. I'm um, looking forward to sort of getting into those those mediums as well. So so by the sounds of it, it's not too different, too dissimilar to the um, the process that I that I do as well with it. So. I've sort of just recently got into these Americana paints. Um, ah. They were at one point quite easy to get in Australia. There was a, an online art store that we could get them, but she has since gone out of business by the looks of it, so I don't quite know how I'm going to get them. But, um, and she did them quite quite cheaply, so they're only, I think, about three to four Australian dollars, which is very good, very good pricing. So, Yeah, I, I like them. I use them a lot. All right, so we're a little bit further along in the build here. Um, this is a different build. This is yep. Elijah. So this is Elijah now, yeah. So yep. sorry for jumping around. I just want to, oh, I want to start talking about that concreting and the the boarding in the set. So yep. I talked about I did a build that I did a, a how to video on. <laughs> when was it? Um, it was a Jimmy Dignan, so a railway kits. Uh, what was it called? It was a, a fuel depot which had okay. the, the shingle sheeting on it. And I did the shingles and it looked like absolute rubbish. So I ended up pulling it all off and using the iron sheeting in it. I was quite happy the way the build came up. So how do you, because obviously the, the color variation in the shingle is is key, the, the subtle, subtle colors that you've got there. So how do you go about doing your shingle sheeting? So typically in, your, in the fine scale kits comes the uh, Campbell uh, shingles. Sure. And I don't, I didn't use those on this. Right. From the kit. I, I used the bar mill shingles. Right. Um, and then all that is is an antique white dry brush. That's right. it. Oh, okay. Because the way and that um, – sorry, go on. Yeah, I, I lifted them and did a dry brush. Yeah. And it. Uh, I, I really like the way the – the finished product turned out. Yeah, that's beautiful. Have you seen the way that uh, Ron from Mind Mount Models does his? I haven't. I I'll haven't. just quickly bring it up briefly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I know a lot of people will put the indig alcohol wash on. They'll use different washes and then dry brush. So he's got these things called Mind Mount Minutes How-Tos. Um, okay. So where are we? So he does the cedar shake sh shingle. shingles. Try spitting yeah. that out. So, <laughs> so we don't. This is quite a new phenomenon because we just don't have this type of roofing in Australia. So, um, so he, so I won't go back over it too much, but you can sort of see the the color variation. Yep. He gets in his. So he's got sort of four colors he uses and then he, he uses this pendulum so it's just like a real light it's a little bit more than a dry brush um yep. but not not as heavy as a full color either and it's just obviously a little bit more processed than what just dry brushing that what you did but um i think it's quite a nice little yeah. process no, the way I've, I've yet to do it but um it's how he does it so then obviously when you're pulling off the shingle and laying them down and each individual in layer, each individual line as you go up the roof, obviously then you get the variation in the, the colouring as you can see on his 
Powers's plumbing on this picture on the the sort of the bottom bottom right hand corner there. Yep. I do the dry brushing after it's all on, obviously. Right. Uh, he's, yeah. He's basically talking about it before he lays it. Yeah, he does it before he it's lays cheap. it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So then, obviously, you go through and then lift some of the shingles uh-huh. to to add that that three dimensional look to it, I suppose. All right. Yep. Okay. Now, this next little section, how are you going there? We've just ticked over an hour, so. No, I'm good. You're all good? good. Okay. Yeah. Didn't want to break? No, I'm good. No? All right. I'm so, I, I'm, what is sort of a little bit close to my heart right now, I'm, I'm trying to find different techniques of how people do different aged wood, and I, I've yet to get it to that level of degradation, so to speak. So um, that's obviously the end product on yep. Elijah's build here, and that's yep. just phenomenal. So we do have other sort of other photos, so I'll refer back to this photo every now and again. But the we've already touched on the hunter lines. So obviously, they're, they're the colours that you use for for your wood. Um, I... I- it's the colors I used on that build. That build, okay. All right, so so and we start with tried that technique. Yeah. So, please tell me if I've got this wrong, but this seems to be the probably the one of the first parts of the process of staining the individual planks up to different degrees. So obviously, the far left here a little bit lighter. Obviously, the middle ones here are quite quite darker stain, and then sort of. Mixture of the both between between the rest of them. So, so how do you actually stain them? You dip them in, or you brush them on, or you dab them, or how, how do you how do you stain them? Whatever I feel like at that moment. That moment, okay. Just, just sometimes I just take a tweezer and I dip, dip four, four, yeah, oh, in, in the okay. bottle, yeah. But what I do is I figure out how many boards I'm going to need sure. for that platform. Yep. And then I divide it into three equal if I can. Yep. And then I hit each stack or section yep. with a color stain. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, obviously, then when you're laying those boards, it's almost like you just mix them all up like a deck of cards and then you then you get the randomness. Is that sort of how, how that goes or there's more? So, I basically – do everything before I glue them down on the platform. Sure. So okay. the first step here was alcohol and in the ink. Sure. Then I come back with the hunter line, three different colors. Yep. Stain the boards. Yep. Then the next step is that next video using yep. those three colors of AK, the right. wood collection um, yep. of acrylics that they have. Sure. I stain the boards once again, different colors. Right. Some will be the tan and the gray mixed. Some will be just the tan. Some will yep. be just the gray. Yeah. And then once that's done, then I come back and I dry brush each board. Yep. The antique white. Yeah, which we got on that that yep. photo there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There. Yeah. Okay. And then I lay the boards. Right. Okay. Then I'll come back in with a pan pastels. And I'll yeah. highlight where I put the joints of the yeah. boards. Those are the colors I use. Sure. Is this we've spoken about this before? <laughs> the photos are actually in order. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So there's sort of the end product. So the lifting of the boards that you suggest there. Um, what I do see here as well, and I'm assuming this is just part of the process, there's quite a lot of texture in, well, it's that layering that, process. It's yeah. a different version. It's the dry brushing. Yeah. 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 Well, that's just fantastic. But and your you, eye goes, your eye goes to where those boards are the, split. Yeah, they are. Yeah. I highlighted it with a different color. Yeah. Styles. Yep. So I can't remember the build, but there's something that sits on there, isn't there? On that. Yeah, there's that, that shed. Yeah. With the aluminum roof. So then obviously you've then 
looked ahead how that's going to look to the board because obviously we've got like metal rusting type colours, I would think, coming through there. So that's obviously integrated into that part of the build as well, is that? Yeah, it's just brown. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a brown colour pan pastel. Sure. But there were um, uh, detail castings that were going to sit there. Sure. So, yeah. Okay. And I actually did the nail holes, I think, on the boards too. Yeah, some go back. Yeah. On the joints. Okay. Go to the right over. Over here. Yeah, right there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah, through there. So another thing I definitely wanted to pick your, your mind on is how to do concrete because I think you've nailed, you've nailed it here with eight, like an age concrete. So yep. I, too, have the age concrete uh, from Flocal sitting in the – Sitting in my layout room, um, all ready to go. So, but I've only got one one bottle of it, so I've got to make sure I take care of it. Yeah. So, let's start through. Say you're going to do the concrete up. Um, so, okay. first of all, what are the what are these? What are these? What's the actual medium? Is it a board or? It's wood. It's wood. It's is wood. It? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you would under prime it to start with. Uh, with with some color, would that be right, or you just go straight in with the color? I, just, I went straight to the alcohol and India ink, right? And then I used the anti uh, the H concrete. Yep. Dip the brush in the H concrete. Yep. While the paint was wet on the brush, dipped it into the uh, hydrocal plaster. Oh uh, yes, okay, I've seen this. Yep. And then stipple it on. I don't paint it on. I stipple it on yep. to the wood. Yep. And it gives it that texture. That texture there. Okay. Yeah. All right. That was, yeah, my next question on how you went about doing that. And I couldn't remember if I read it on yours with the yeah. the, pla the, the the concrete or the plaster, I should yeah. say. Yeah. So the next step after that, we go in with obviously some lovely awards there. Um, Thanks. Obviously those pan pastels, lovely. Um, so we're, we're going along further with this build. So you just use like a... Sort of the next step, um, what we call brick or a, a briquette for your barbecue or yeah, for your pit, yeah. depending on what you how you're cooking. So it's just a matter of grabbing that off and grabbing that, yeah, that color. Yeah, just take sand, sandpaper and yeah. scrape it off on top, um, and then just work it in. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think we've got that on there. The next photo here. So obviously you've scrapped it off. Yep. You have obviously scribed the the expansion joints into yep. into that with a with a hobby knife. Yep. And then you've really obviously concentrated. This is obviously a little bit further along, but you've really concentrated on getting that black into into all the nooks and crannies. So you've obviously got some irregularities or cracks appearing in how do how do you do that? I just did it with an exacto knife. Okay. So you just ran yeah. that across, just okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, randomly. Yeah. yeah, you could actually, if you don't feel comfortable doing it, you could take a pencil. Yeah, draw it in. I think I've I've done it with a, a pencil or a very fine black pen before. Yeah, I think the black pen just just a little bit too dark. I think from from my point of point of view. So then obviously then you just go back through and then start weathering up randomly with your, your pan pastels. So we've got sort of uh, what do we got? Three different grays there in the in the yep. in the, in that shade. Yep. Okay. And just work it in. And if it's too much, take a pencil eraser. Eraser and, and get it off. Erase. Yeah. So obviously that's it. In, in situ, that's it. in the on the on the build as you're as you're going along. Yeah. So this is um we're jumping forward quite a bit further here. So this is uh, obviously the rear or side yard to to Elijah's. Um, obviously you've gone through, you've put some of your 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 detail parts all together. The 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 actual main structure is nearly nearly built by the looks of it, um, if not already built. So you've started 
forming the scene, so to speak. You've laid the track down, uh, ballast it all up, and I'll, we'll talk about the, the scenery in a sec. But so, how do you? It seems to be a fine art from my point of view. So you've got quite a number of castings here. Do you when you when you're setting them in place? Do you sort of you'll you'll put them down on the on the concrete there, and you'll just move them around, keep moving and looking at different angles. Okay, I don't quite like the look of that. I'll move that. Okay, I'll put it at another angle. Uh, I don't like the way that cut is at forty five degrees or whatever. Is that? Um, talk us through how you you place all those these, those, those detail parts. I mean, these castings. I just looked at the pictures that George right. provided. The okay. Kit. Yep. Um, and if I, you know, if I wanted to move some around, I moved them around. But before I glued them down, I'd take a picture through the camera. Sure. And see how they look. Okay. Yeah. So these ones here are more a representation of how George Selios did it. Um, on, yeah, they all okay. came with a kit. Okay. Yeah. So did you sort of take any sort of poetic license? Obviously, I see quite a number of um, up on the top here, uh, palettes and more detail parts, I suppose. Um, is that what he had on there? I haven't actually looked at it. Yeah, yes. Oh, lovely. If you ever get a chance to see his layout, oh, you got I would love to. <laughs> I would love to. As I said, we had a, a trip planned for later on this year, which more, more than likely won't be happening now, but will be next year before we get over there, I would think. But it's a matter of whether I get up to Boston is the next thing, unfortunately. Yeah. All right, so I think I know what you're going to say. Oh, we haven't even touched on this uh, retaining, retaining wall here, so that's probably for a... Could just about go through a whole video cast just on I would think just that scene in itself I would think so um that's obviously like a little creek scene or drainage yeah. system at the edge of the build yeah. so is that how it was on his picture no. as well or is that no some, not really no because no. no. that's it's quite interesting how how you've constructed that it just seems to be some staff members over the years have literally just come up on the board here and just thrown it. <laughs> Is that how you yeah. sort of, how you've looked yeah. at it, how, how you've done it, or how would that look type thing if... Yeah, and, just, and I had those parts just, you know, in little cups yeah. stored away, and I yeah. just pulled them out sure, um, and used them. Yeah. As I said, that just... I don't quite know how to describe it, how that sort of adds to a scene, like... Many of us, we you know, might put a few pieces of driftwood in there, and that's sort of it. But going through and putting old, you know, pulley wheels and tires, and yeah, and the pallets just just adds that depth to it, which is just starts to finish off the scene. Which I, you know, a lot of people would be happy with that at that point. But obviously, you've gone one step further, as we'll talk about in a sec. All right, so that's obviously stepped a lot. Further through the same scene, um, yep. obviously the, the models are not at the top there anymore because you've started using some some re well not resins but some water effects that you don't want to get on that on the, the rest of the model. I wouldn't think so. Yeah. So how have you? Obviously you've dammed it up because I see you've got cut with scissors. Um, so that that was the formation that George recommended. It came in the kit. Oh, okay. So I just cut that out. Yeah. It wasn't really a creek scene. Right. Uh, but I used the dimensions and everything that he provided in the kit. Sure, sure. So how do you do your water? Uh, what what product do you use? So on Cartwrights, I use the Woodland Scenics Murky Water, right. which is a two-part epoxy. Right, okay. Uh, you got to get that right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, as it never dries. <laughs> this, this is Vallejo water texture, right. which basically already mixed. Yeah. Got to put it on on thin layers. Sure. 
So that's what I, I mean, the first layer is mixed with like a greenish murky color. Yeah. And then I kept coming back with multiple layers of sure. just clear, of okay. clear. Okay. So that is the the last thing you do after all this shrubbery. Is that how you do it? Um, to sort of then you sort of mild that, get that shrubbery to start lapping up to to that all the yes. weeds and all the yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. So that's Martin Warburg's product all there, or was that or a yep. bit of everything? No, all of it's his. All his. Okay. Yeah. So you, do you buy it? So obviously we touched on. Mina Nature and Silfa, which is, is it, I'm assuming Martin's stuff or products, not stuff, but products are sold similarly in little, like the, you know, the sort yeah. of graft tufts where they sort of yeah. got some sort of uh, adhesive on the back of them. Okay. But I use, a, I use a, a, like a rubber cement. It's called five in one, I think. Beacons five in one. Right. Okay. Uh, you can, you can <laughs> use Elmer's glue. I've I found with Elmer's, oh, so not just say white pea. I don't know what's the type I use. You have got to be a little bit careful when you're using water effects around that because I've found that I don't know. As I said, I don't know whether it's the white glue or PBO glue that I was using. That if you're putting shrubbery on a say a creek line, um, yeah. that that white color almost starts to bleed in a little bit to. To the waterline, I've found. So I, was, I haven't, don't know whether that I haven't done enough water to sort of test whether that's the glue I'm using, oh, or okay. um, I've, have you had that before? Obviously, rubber glue you wouldn't have, have that, but okay. No. And on the that retaining wall, <clears throat> back we go. Yep. Go back, yeah. That is just some shrubs from Martin Welberg that I cut sure. really, really small. Yeah. And put it so it looked like uh, it was growing out of the wall. Yeah, okay. So, as I said, we for the interest of keeping this under 24 hours in length. Um, <laughs> yeah. So just quickly on this 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 wall, because it's obviously features uh -huh. quite predominantly, was that individual boards or was that hydro cow? Oh, okay, uh, individual, individual. individual boards. All right, so then yeah. you can get that. Okay. And I use the same technique. Yeah. Split them okay. up, stained them yeah. differently, came back with the wood colors from Vallejo. Yeah. And then dry brushed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now we're, I think that's probably one of the final photos because obviously the, the lighting is very, very nice there. So, what <laughs> I know that you've gone pretty well to prototype so to speak in what i mean by prototype is off the photo that george as yeah. he is has he has yeah. printed it i just there's something about that scene that words can't describe and what i mean by that is there's there's so much clutter there but it, it's it works so well to put it very yeah. very it's just it, I don't know. Um, it's hard to describe what what that scene is. Um, it, it. So as I said, there's you know we've got all this on the left hand side over here. There just seems to be so much clutter, but it's so clean looking. I'm not not saying that in a bad way. What I'm trying to yeah, what I'm trying to get at it's it's not overdone. I suppose is what what where I'm trying to go with that. Um, I think you know you can look at it a photo which is two dimensional, but the way that you've nailed that build because obviously with the colorings you use, you know, it's just a delight to the eye, so to speak. And the way I look at it, um, I definitely don't mean the clutter or overdoing anything negative. It's just, you look at it and go, it's meant to be cluttered. It's meant to be yeah. worn, overgrown yeah. at the end of its life. If not, it's someone's just moved out of it, possibly never to use, use the, um, the facility again, but it just, it's just one of those scenes where you can just look, you can stare into, and I'm sure if I looked at that photo again, I'd I'd pick up something different each time I look into it. It's just one of those, one of those scenes that I think you've just hit the nail on the head with it. So, so well done, oh, well done. That. Yeah, that's how that's how his layout is. Yeah, I mean, you know, we went up there last June and we had five hours there, and. Yeah. 
I mean, five hours wasn't enough. My sure. girlfriend, Trish, was like, you know, how are you guys going to spend five hours here? And she ended up spending <laughs> half of that time. She was amazed. Yeah. I mean, every time you look at it, you see something different. Sure. And, you know, I was there 15 years ago, 16 years ago. I, I really, looking back on it, I don't think I appreciated it sure. like I did this last time. Yeah. And I'm constantly studying his pictures. Yeah. Um, I'm constantly studying Doug's pictures. Yeah. I mean, personally, I think Doug is our generation now. Yeah. George Sellier. Okay. I mean, Doug's phenomenal. Yeah. I would definitely like to reach out to him and get him on this show at some stage. Um, yeah. Maybe when I'm a little bit bigger channel. <laughs> But, you know, we'll see. I'll email him and what's the worst he could say? I don't have time right now, but I can deal with that. So. What we need to do is get Martin Welberg on here. Well, here he funny you say that. I definitely would like to do that, I think. So <laughs> I think we've, it could be the sort of thing that we might move forward and, you know, bring you on as well because I could probably have two of you in with me recording it like this quite quite easily and have screenshots okay. and all that. But that, that could be a lot of fun. Yeah, he's a fun guy. He's yeah. just a nerd guy. So it's just obviously we're looking at uh, more of the detail here. Um, looks like you've taken the roof off to sort of really get that, that inner detail. So Yeah, I mean, that was the last thing I put on. Yeah, yeah. That was difficult to put that roof on, that platform, or that whole contraption on top of the platform. Because <laughs> organic <laughs> aluminum... Yeah. Basically warped. Yeah. Okay. Warped. So, yeah. It's tough. But I just love that wood. That's just fantastic. Thank you. I do like these little outbuildings as well. Um, it's something I've tried. It, tell me, it's like a tar paper type building. Is that correct? Actually, that's, yeah. actually, that's cardboard. Yeah. Cardstock. Sure. That's painted. And then yeah, put okay. your back. And that gives you that nice little, um, uh -huh. that nice uh -huh. little texture as well. So, yeah. and that that would be easy to build, or easier, yeah. to scratch to yeah. scratch build as well. So, uh -huh. so now this little water wheel, I sort of took me by surprise. Now, is that what's that made out of? Is that just it's a metal casting? It's a metal casting. All right, so it looks yeah. quite a large metal casting. So. It's, you know, it's, it's three parts. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, how would you, how would you build that? So same sort of thing, because it's obviously you're very, very good at, at the way you've weathered that. So talk us through that the process of how you would sort of get, get to that point, I suppose. Obviously that's on cart rights. Um, yeah. yeah. So you would un undercoat that with a metal primer and then what, what sort oh, yeah. of... I primed it gray. Yeah. Came back with the boxcar red. Sure. Then the alcohol and India wash to tone yep. it down. Yeah. Then dry brushed it with uh, rust colors. Sure. And then took the pan pastels uh, individually through the uh, – where the uh, – Slats are, yeah, and highlighted those in like a, a dark gray. Oh, uh, okay, yep, yeah. Okay. And then you can see some antique white yeah. dry brushing. Yeah, yep. just on the just on the licks on the edges there. Yep. Uh, yep. It sort of gives that 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 more worn look as well, doesn't it? So, yeah, that's good. So now we're sort of looking at the the finished diorama of. Uh, what's that? That's cart rights, isn't it? So, um, so if you're going to go back to say, if you were going to build that again, is there anything you would change, or would you? What 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 techniques would you would you go maybe go back and use? So I have the walls and the castings for that. Yeah, I I had bought the castings an extra set back right. when I had this. I'm going to do it in a different color. Okay. Like the roof on that building was supposed to be 
corrugated aluminum. Right, I see. And I changed it to a shingle roof. Right, okay. Um, that was supposed to be track yep. laid down. Sure. Here, yeah. Just just the thought of hand laying track yeah. didn't interest me. Didn't interest you, so, yeah. Okay. So somebody suggested make it look like it's, you know, just weren't, you know, not there anymore. Yeah, okay. So. That's a lovely I, thing. I did put down like uh, tie plates that had used to be there. Yeah, yeah. To see because they're so tiny. But yeah. So obviously now we've got the the, the back side, so to speak, yeah. of Cartwrights. Um, yep. So did you, did this come, this power pole here, did that come with a kit? Was that something that you? No, it came. It that came. came with it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I find power poles are one of those things that just add that vertical dimension to it. So you sort of build from your ground up with all your, you know, your, your, your plonky building where wherever it's going to go. You've got your, your detail. And I just think utility poles just add that next next level of realism that sort of ties sort of the rest of the world sort of off off to the right hand side of that truck um in with the building if that makes sense it sort of you know no, ties the, the real world bringing in into that building it's just and i've done it on, on mine i use a i don't have them quite as ornate as that however the ones that i the string that i use is like a it's almost like a very fine elastic band or elastic. Oh yeah, is um, it called easy? Is it called easy wire? That's the one, easy wire. Yes. Um, okay, so is that what that I, is, or no? That's actually just thread. But I had made oh. a post about that being such a bitch to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of comments came back. We use easy wire. We use yeah. easy wire, <laughs> and. Uh, I just haven't used it. Um, yeah. These these aren't fun to do. I mean, it's no. It, so what I found I mean, with with Easy Wire, you could get. I don't know how. When we last went there, I didn't really take much notice of the the utility poles that we've. In Australia, we've got like almost like a, a quite just a little bit of a sag in it, so they're not taut, uh -huh. um, uh -huh. and that's quite easy to do with that with because it's with the Easy Wire because it's just got a little bit of. A little bit of weight to it, probably more than a thread. Yeah, um, it's got some weight to it. Yeah, so I don't know what you found with a thread as well. Obviously, that's not a, a zoomed-in picture. That the that rather large ship ship build that I did. Um, looking back at that, I probably should have used Easy Thread for that. Now I'm thinking about it, but I used a thread which has just got the very fine, fluffy edges to it, which annoyed me a little bit. But that's all I had at that given time to to do the rigging. But um, hence another reason but my the reason i've used it easy thread as well it does have a little bit of give to it so if you accidentally knock it because mine part of mine goes across a track um and if it's obviously if, if, you're, if i'm cleaning track or something it's just a little bit more forgiving than a thread yeah. that just snaps off yeah i'm gonna have to try it on the next one yeah it's pretty you can buy it in different colors as well i think you can buy yeah. it in a a very dull sort of grey that looks more, more, more wire type, I suppose. Um, or you could use on on a fence line, and it comes in different uh, different thicknesses as well. So you are into trains. You've got a wagon there. <laughs> I, I have I have cars that yeah. I've accumulated over the years. Yeah, I didn't do that. I didn't do that weathering. Yeah. Um, and that car doesn't fit the air. I just wanted to put a car on there yeah. just for the picture. That's all sure. I did. Yeah. Oh. I don't think it matters if it doesn't fit the era too much. I just like that, you know, the uh, graffiti on the car. Yep. Where are we going? Graffiti. Hang on, I've lost you. Yeah, that's lovely. So you okay? You said you didn't do the weathering, so I, didn't, no. I did. I did try with graffiti um, 
doing some decals, like, you know, um, wet slide decals or decals. decals. Um, they worked okay, but the made a bit difficult with the weathering. Even if you sort of sprayed a dull coat layer over the top of it and then started to sort of seal the, the decal in, it sort of worked okay, but just still gives it a bit of a shine, but it's probably the paper I was using more than anything, so. Gotcha. Yeah, I've never tried it. So that's probably at this point in time the end of talking about that build. So we're coming up to nearly an hour and a half. Did you you happy to keep going for a little bit longer or Good. Good. Yeah? let's go. Yeah. So I posed out a question for a few Facebook pages um, that I was having the pleasure of, of chatting with you. And it has been a pleasure, mind you. Um, it's been a lot of fun. And just yeah. asking if there's any questions that people had for you. So I had uh, a few people come back, and I haven't gone through all of them, and I do apologise for the people who took the time of making a question or giving a question, and if I don't go through this. Now, I've started with the, the heavy hitters at the top. Frank Varga has taken the time out to um, ask a question. And you know as well as I that the skills of that man are, are next yeah, level. Um, and he's one of the, the go-to people, I think, and obviously he's in the, the latest podcast that I'm interested in listening yeah. to. So yeah. so he says, Hi, Craig. We've all noticed your transition to a higher caliber of modeling. Besides scenery products, what do you credit regarding your rapid advancement in modeling? And he says, keep up the inspiring work. Oh, and I'll, and coming from that man saying inspiring work, yeah. I'd be... Yeah. I'd be a little bit chuffed. <laughs> um, I think what's helped me grow as a modeler is I'm willing to take chances and I'm willing to try different techniques. Sure. Uh, I'm always trying different things. You know, this next diorama I'm doing, I got to have uh, an asphalt road. Sure. So on my Facebook page, I use the AK asphalt to yeah. test it out and see how it works. Right. Right. Um, and what I did is I went to AK's website. They got a video on applying the asphalt and how they weather it. And then I just went and did exactly what they did in the video. Sure. So yeah. I, I'm always looking to try new things. Yeah. And I think that's that's well documented with you as well. Um, that seems to be you go. You just want to keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. And I think that's, that's sort of, in, from my point of view, quite infectious that – it makes you want to keep trying because ultimately we're working to get towards to this level. Um, so thank you for that. So it's definitely something that I've started to do, hence with the, the little jetties we spoke about before. It's just a matter of trying and making those mistakes on, on your scrap and then taking what you've learnt through to the more expensive models, so to speak, so you don't bugger them up, so to, so to speak. I, I, and the other thing is some of my biggest – mess ups have turned out to be great results the, the biggest triumphs yeah so I, I mean i've made mistakes and what i thought was a mistake and it actually turned out really cool yeah. but I'm not, I'm not afraid to reach out to these model guys that we all look up to and sure. ask yeah. questions and i encourage people to do that yeah we're all here we all started the same way yeah yeah you know I'll just I'll let you in on a little secret here. I think you mean you'll be one of my go-to people now. So I apologise for some of the photos I send through. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I do it all the time, and yeah. you know, there's probably five or six guys when I'm doing something, I'll sure. send them pictures. What do you think? Sure. When they're building, they send me pictures. What do you think? And it's just that's how we do it. Yeah. And that's how you're going to get better. Yeah. And I think this is where this niche of the hobby is so inviting. Um, there's other niches of within model railroading without sort of going too deep into it are not like that. Um, they're a lot more guarded about what they do and they're very vocal, I suppose. Keyboard warriors, I suppose, is, is another phrase that gets bandied around on social media that that's um, – and it's happened to me as well with a, a particular video that I put out. Um, 
that I got some quite negative feedback, um, but not almost verging on nasty, I suppose. Um, I think this is where, you know, I think we can all get we get feedback. But there is a way about going and doing that um, to the individual with adding an undertone of encouragement. And I think this is where fine scale modelling hits the nail on the head. And I've started that with the Wiley boys. And I think they're good proponents of, of, our, of our niche in regards to that. And I've met some awesome people, including yourself, who would have thought, you know, three or four months ago, or probably five, six months ago now, when I started down this journey of craftsman kits that I would be talking to the modelling cavalry of yourself, the Wiley boys. I've had, you know, Jeff Grove, his name, he's a, he's a legend within this, this niche of the hobby, yeah. hobby. And then just like they're so freely here, have my information, have my information. So um, I think it's important that – that we, Look, in my, we, in my yeah. profession of racket customizing, my competitors will never answer a question. Sure. They're just guarded. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's ridiculous. Uh, we all, there's enough business to go around. Yeah. Obviously, none of us are doing this as a business, but uh, I, I've recently been reaching out to the, uh, the European military modeling guys. Sure them and they're more than welcome more yeah. than happy to uh tell me how they do stuff yeah i am um, i spent 45 minutes in messenger just telling me how he was doing weathering yeah so i'm a large supporter and i i wrote a an article that's going to be in this little magazine it's called paying it forward right. um and it was Okay, so one of the, the main drives behind me starting up the social media and particularly my YouTube was to pay it forward. Um, mm-hmm. Locally here in South Australia, I've got some awesome mentors that help me through um, to the building of my layout and various aspects that, and they're quite a fair bit older than me. They're sort of in their 70s, and but they're like my, my best friends. Um we're quite often ringing each other and, you know, what about this and what about that type of thing? But there's there's a point where there's some of the stuff, I'm sure I can teach them some some things, but they've showed, given me so much that I'm paying that forward in my videos, that putting it out there, whoever wants to watch it, take sure. it on board. If you don't like it, that that's fine too. Um, but I think as modelers, we... It's not a right of passage is probably the right phrase, but we've got a responsibility, I think, to, to keep this hobby going for the youth and, to and you know, you're doing it in your Facebook, you know, the Jason Jensen's of this world um, in his videos as well, of, uh, doing just that. You you know, you've learned these skills from from Howard Zane, like you've said, Mark Wahlberg, uh, Wahlberg, I should say, um, and you're paying it forward in helping me out talking about your models and how we're doing it. So I just think this this niche of the hobby, hobby has, from my point of view, hit the nail on the head regarding progressing forward and the betterment of this hobby. Look, the reason I built that Facebook page is because of Jason Jensen. Sure. I mean, he told me to put your stuff out there and tell people how you're doing it from right. the beginning. Uh, I didn't expect it to take off like it's... You know, I didn't expect to be on a podcast with the Wileys. Sure. I didn't expect to be talking to a guy from Australia on a Saturday night about <laughs> how I do models. Yeah. I never expected that two years ago. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I think we all can give back to the hobby. Yeah, and I think it's very important. I'm quite quite passionate about that side of things that, you know, Australia is obviously 25 million people, so there's less modelers per head of capita, so to speak. So we're a lot smaller over here, but um, we're all got something to learn from someone and yep. we need to encourage each other and not be the keyboard warrior, so to speak. Yep. And, you know, I I remember you, you've probably heard of Kathy Millett from the uh, United yeah. Kingdom. I watched her um, video. Yeah, she put out a video oh, probably nearly two years ago now that she was nearly in tears about... Um, these keyboard warriors that she thought were friends um, 
and how they treated her with this particular build and how much they rub, not, 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 rubbished her, et cetera, upset her that much. One, she had to do a video. And secondly, you could tell she was quite emotional about it. And that's that's quite upsetting that there's people out there that are willing to do that. But yeah, I think they're just jealous that a fine scale lady like that can can model to, to, to that to that caliber. I think that's what it comes down to. So she's a great modeler. She is a great modeler. She's definitely a great modeler. So all right, so there's we'll quickly delve in. because uh, we're where are we at? Uh, an hour forty now. It's time's getting away. It's been fantastic. So Chris Galvin is another one that's come up with a, a question. Um okay. so Craig's modeling I don't, I don't know, Chris. Um, I think this came off, I think it might have been HO scale. Um, so he's on grass and ground foliage. Um, sorry, I'll just start the whole question again. On his grass and ground foliage, does he do any colour changes to the grasses to get the overall contrast? So that's the first part of the question. So I suppose he's he's wanting to ask, how do you get the the gradations? Do you use obviously some of that static grass? Um, no, 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 no static grass. Okay. Uh, the only static grass I've used is in uh, the O scale diorama. Okay. I just mix it yep. in, which is up now. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but everyone teases me because I have all of Martin's products, so he has all the different color variations. Right. And I just mix them all in. Yeah, okay. So I like what I do. So yeah. do you – okay, so the next part to that question, static grass applicator. Do you, did you use one or – Yeah, I do. I use the Woodland Scenics uh, – what is it, Grassmaster? No. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and that's whatever, not, not Grassmaster. Yep. I know the one whatever. you mean. So, yeah. yeah. And I got it from Scenic Express when they sure. had a sale. Uh, I've used it once. Yep. Yeah, I've used my. I've got a, a knock grass master, um, and I've used that quite predominantly, and it's a nice little little tool. Not a very cheap tool, but a necessary yeah. one, that's for sure. So I also use a knock, which is obviously a German brand. Yeah. Also, make it like a little puffer bottle that you put it, put the grass fibers into this, and you shake it around, and just by purely the static electricity on your hand, and by shaking it around, you can sort of just a little bit more finite detail um, you can use as well. It sort of it doesn't stand up quite as nice as a, a true st static machine, so to speak. But once it's sort of if the yeah, adhesive starts going off, I found if you can sort of just tease it up with a a, a, um, a paintbrush or something similar, it, it's quite effective as well for those little hard-to-reach areas. So I'll tell you a funny story. You know how we're talking about making mistakes and trying things? Yeah. So on a scale shed – pilot model, I decided I was going to use a little static grass sure. and uh, put the glue down with a brush and everything, put the static grass in the container and then start shaking it, right? Yeah. What I forgot to do was turn on the static grass machine. <laughs> okay. Okay? Yeah. So now I've laid down static grass that's flat yeah. on the ground. Yeah. So I came back with glue on top, yeah. turned on the machine the way it's supposed to be used, yeah. and it actually turned out to give it a cool effect right. of grass laying down and grass standing up. Yeah, okay. There's a, an Australian model at Luke Towen. I don't know if yeah, you've I seen know. Yeah, so some of his stuff, he does a bit something a bit similar to that. But obviously, the grass, he puts it on, but then he flattens it down. So, yep. um, so yeah, I might give that a try as well because obviously you, you, want, you don't want it all standing up like, a, like yeah. it's had an electric shock, which technically it has. Exactly. But, um, exactly. So Mike Larson has – who's a gentleman I – not aware of. Um, he says, Craig, what techniques do you use to bring up scenery to the edges of a building? So uh, I assume he's talking about the green, uh, the ground effects. Yeah. I, I use the uh, AK terrain. Sure. Which comes in different colors. Yeah. Like dry, uh, you know, dry mud, what else? Uh, light earth, dry ground. I always lay that down. Sure. And mix while it's down, I'll sprinkle my dirt on. Yeah. So I apply it with a paintbrush. 
Okay. And it's water soluble. Yeah. So I can put, you know, get it up there. And if it gets on, I can just wipe it off with the water. Sure, sure. So how do you apply it right up there? What sort of applicator do you use, like a little tea stain? I, I just use a brush. A brush and just brush it up there. Yes. Okay. Uh-huh. Yep. Okay. Because yep. I've seen a, another technique. Who yep. was it? Uh, I think it might have been Todd Wiley, actually. He used like a bent over sort of what would you call it, a little piece of card stock or something similar, and he sort of, it's almost like a, an open-ended funnel, so to speak, that he sort of just runs along oh, yeah. to, yeah. to get it up there as well. But yeah. so there is various ways. Yeah, I mean, I have pallet handles, you know, uh, yeah. little pallets. Uh, you could use that. Sure, sure. I suppose depending on the the access, accessibility, isn't it, You depending what you're going to use, so. Because I use a lot of pallet knife as well to sort of yeah, move exactly. things up there or getting it right in there. So, so the next one's from Michael Short. So this is obviously very, very broad, and there's probably stuff we've spoken about anyway. But he's taken the time to. Sure. Uh, uh, so he ask also his list of go-to tools and cheats on weathering. So we probably haven't touched on tools a lot. So let's maybe focus on that a little bit. What sort of? That's obviously very broad because we're talking about either. I don't um, think my collection of tools that I'm using are any different than any of the other guys. Sure. Obviously, it's the, the exacto knives, yeah. the number of oven blade, uh, straight edge razors, you know, that we use to lift boards, um, pounce wheel to put nail holes. Yeah. Uh, just rulers. I mean, I don't. I try to keep it simple. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean that's basically all I use. Um, yeah, that would be it. Yeah. Okay. So obviously the next one cheats on weathering, but we've sort of, I think we've through this whole interview or chat we've sort of spoken about how how you weather various things. So. Probably won't lament on that too much unless there's anything more that you sort of I mean, we think we say, haven't talked about. Or I would just say the big thing with weathering is don't try to think you need to accomplish the final result on the first layer. Yeah, that's my mistake. <laughs> you got, you got yeah. to be patient. You got to take steps. Sure. Um, do not forget and make sure you try to master as much as you can the dry brushing technique. Sure. That is the most important step, I think. Sure. Um, you know, I see some of these guys on the Facebook page, they build these models in like a week. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know how. I don't yeah. know how. Um, you got to really take your time. Yeah, yeah. If you want to get a high-level, detailed yeah. diorama yeah. or structure yeah. built. No, you're right there. So definitely, definitely. So... All right, so the next one's from a chap, Damon Nelson. Okay. So this is a bit of a an interesting one. So I can edit this out if you don't want this in. So okay. um, could you ask him what technique he has tried and absolutely failed at? I know I've been there before. So we've talked about trying techniques and failing for maybe what we're trying to do, but then coming up with this awesome technique for something else. Um what techniques have I failed at? Yeah. Everyone, every everyone, one of them. Everyone, and then you've just refined. That's a good answer. Yeah. Every one of them. I just sure. kept practicing and getting better at it. Sure. Yeah. So, but you have to fail in anything to, to get better at it. Yeah. No, you're right there. So definitely, definitely. So. So that's sort of uh, the end of the road at this point in time. Is there anything else that more you wanted to no. sort of go up with? So obviously we've talked about a lot tonight. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to touch on the pictures of the O scale anymore or? Um, yeah, we can definitely bring them up. Where are we? All right. So let me get up the right screen. So yeah, Oscar. That's that's. So do you want to touch on how I did the ground effect? Definitely. So we we briefly talked early on, obviously that the sculptor mold. So yeah. So the, like we talked about, the first process is uh, that's all foam base. Uh, yeah. 
And then I take the sculpt the mold on top. Sure. I mix up the sculpt the mold. Yep. This is the first yep. diorama I've ever used that on. Right. Uh, I use a cheap chocolate brown acrylic from Americana or folk art sure. in there just to get the white out of the sculpt the mold. Yeah. Yeah. Lay it down. Sure. Um, and then I'll mix a little bit of dirt, different uh, fine grades of the dirt, just sure. a touch of it yep. in spots. Yep. Put some rocks down in spots. Sure. Let that dry. Then the next day, um, I'll come back. Yep. And I'll do the uh, the glue and water, but sure. I'll paint it on. Right. Okay. okay. Paint it on. And then I'll take a hair dryer to it and get it nice and dry. And sure. then I'll just mix up the AK 502 brown and black oils. Yep. Paint that on. Taking a uh, um, hair dryer, dry that. Yep. And then I'll go back with the colors, four or five different shades of tan, dry right. brush. Right. And then the last thing I do is I come back with the AK or uh, AK or the 502 or the Vallejo pigments, and I'll actually yep. color the ground. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So like there by the signs, it looks like it's Oops. a walkway. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to ask. How you know? Obviously, that's so that's done with how pigments. you've constructed it's all that. done with pigments. Right. Okay. I've dabbled with that, but I've used with a very sort of a wider soft brush, and you've got to be a little bit careful doing it this way as well. Um, using different coloured tile grouts as well. Yeah, you can do that. Probably. Um, yeah. Because sure. I've used um, like tile grout, sort of a browny colour, sort of underneath. Yep. Um, and then you run a, a what would you call it, sort of a isopropanol water glue wash yep. through it. And then obviously, because yep. it's obviously got natural glues within it, um, you got to be that careful all. using the glue because then it, I found it can go a little bit shiny and that's hard to get rid of um, if you sort of want that real, real dull matte, matte finish. So. so come back and dull coat, spray dull coat the whole thing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I did not do on Cartwrights. Right. Uh, but I did do on this. Just on Delco, have you had the scenario? Because different commentary I've heard that Delco, you got to be a little bit careful with, particularly on a wagon. Um, have you found this in your buildings? If you've gone back through with Delco, that it doesn't eliminate your your weathering that you have done, but it ha it sort of Sort of masks it a little bit, if that makes sense. Um, it sort of dulls it right down, so which it sort of takes away from the weathering that you've already done. So, there's, as I said, there's I've heard this more in people weathering up locomotives and wagons. Um, have you ever found that with on buildings? Yeah, sometimes with Bragdon. Yeah. Uh, chucks. Yeah, but I haven't had that problem with pan pastels. Okay. Yeah. I think I need to get these pan pastels. I think you've yeah, sold me. Yeah, uh, they're uh, one. Once you try them, you'll get hooked on them. Yeah. One thing I I really love about this this building that we're talking about now. Uh, so, what was the name of it again? There, I don't even know the name of the. Oh, okay. The kit. He hasn't okay. even named it yet. Oh, okay. All right. We'll have to. It came with no instructions. Oh, okay. Even better. <laughs> we'll have to definitely. Mate, reach out to him and say we've spoken about it. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, so obviously there's obvious what are we call the, the stud walling uh -huh. with inside the building, which is the, the detail, which is a lot easier to do in O-scale. So for yes. that, I'm assuming that forms the bracing for the walls for this for this kit. Is that what you found? Or So yeah. that was all laser cut right. by him. And what he wanted at the beginning was – just lay the uh, corrugated aluminum over that, okay? Oh, okay. But I took it one step further and I tar papered right. the okay. whole walls okay. and then yeah. went back to the uh, corrugated aluminum on top. Yeah, okay. I wanted it, you know, to be that that detailed. Yeah, okay. So obviously that takes away 
then how would you colour the inside of that that so corrugated that aluminum? Spray, yeah, I spray the walls. Yeah, uh, like a khaki colour. Right. And then took those three colours of Vallejo and painted all the uh, yeah. studs. Sure. And then I dry brushed everything antique white. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a nice, yeah, nice shed. All right, let's, I think we'll go back to the first photo. Back here. All right, yep. so that model, is that finished at that point in time? But so that, I'm going to leave the... I'm going to leave the front open at sure. the top. Yeah. I haven't put the doors on. Right. But the back part of that roof part is yeah. going to be closed. Right. Okay. I'm going to leave one open, one closed. Right. Um, the model's not glued down. It's just sitting there. Just sitting there. Yep. 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 <clears throat> yep. I got to glue that cupola on top of the roof. Yep. Uh, the roof was going to be corrugated aluminum. Sure. And I just thought it was too much corrugated aluminum. Yep. Yeah. So those uh, roof trusses yeah. were uh, laser cut. Sure. And then what I did is Starbucks has this great coffee stirs for their five dollar <laughs> coffee. Yeah. And I hand laid uh, those stirs across those trusses and then yeah. put the tar paper on the roof. Uh, on okay. Top. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I do like the tar paper. Something I've experimented with a fair bit. Um, sort of making it look quite. That's a better, better example of it. Um, yeah. So those, the glazing you've got there on the yeah. the cupola. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. How have you done that? So I hate using acetate. Yeah. I just hate trying to cut it and yeah get yeah. It square. Uh, I use gallery glass. Ah, oh, I said this gallery glass. Okay. So you can use uh, canopy glue. Right. And I just supply it with a toothpick on uh, Okay, yep. You got to play with it because sometimes it will leave some bubbles in it yep. or some pitfalls. Yeah. Um, but on that, it came out this time. So yeah. I use that and I'll come back and uh, I'll either spray it with dull coat or take uh, pan pastels and yep. just dirty it up. Yeah, okay. And that sort of gives that enough opaqueness to be able to sort of see through a little bit, but not seeing right through if you yep. haven't hyper detailed the inside. So, yep. And if you wanted to put a uh, a window shade on the back of it, yeah, you just yep. take paint and you paint over it. Right. Yeah. I've I've tried that technique. That's quite. That comes up quite nicely. Yeah, works great. Yeah, works great. The static grass that we've got there. Um, yeah. You mix all the different shades, the colours, the lengths. You know, that looks something yeah. in between. Lengths I sort of use are between two and six millimetres. Is that similar to what you use there? or? Yeah, I think it's four and six. Four and six, okay. Yeah. And then you just... I remember, I messed it up, so it was laying flat. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's coming up very nicely. I'd, yeah. It's no, almost I like a wind windswept effect that you've got yeah. going across going across there that works quite, quite well. So. But what I like about that that image is see to the right, you can see the rocks are highlighted. Yeah. Because dry brushed. Yeah. Yeah. That's something definitely I'm going to look into. I've done what they call a leopard spotting technique with, with rock faces, but I've never, never tried it with, with the ground cover. Yeah. So I'd like that. And I think that's got a lot of merit. I know you go back through with quite a few colors, but yeah. I, I think even with just one or two colors, I think it would just make that pop a lot more for. Yeah, I mean, you could do one dark tan yeah. and one light tan. Yeah. And it would, yeah, it would pop. Yep. But the key is the alcohol, the uh, oil, black and brown wash. Sure, sure. And wherever you don't like where the, the shade it comes out, just do uh, the pigments on it. And that's right. what I did there. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So we, we start with the ground. The ground cover, then we move up yep. um, with uh, the, the weed bushes and all that. So, 
So what sort of product is that? Some some sort of... So he has different uh, heights of bushes. Sure. And then I just vary the heights. Right. Okay. And the colors. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing I did here was after I did the ground, I put in all the bushes where I wanted it. Yeah. And then came back and did the static grass. Is uh, that right? Okay. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it oh, just worked on this. I don't think it really I matters. Did. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't. I, I didn't. I was kind of um, scared. Static no, I think grass. it looks, looks nice. Um, yeah, I like the way it turned out. Static grass is one of those things that when you use the applicator, it sort of goes everywhere, hence why I got this little bottle as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. The one I use by Knock has since developed like a little funnel, so it comes out to almost something that might be half an inch across then it sort of funnels down and so it makes a loom yep. more but it's still you're still then six or nine inches away from your baseboard when you're or you know you the, the base right. of you so that the control's not quite there but um no that that's quite a that's quite effective the way you've sort of you you, you define paths and the the, the tramput area is going through um that looks quite that that's very nice so, yeah, I just think – I know George Selios, I think someone mentioned that he doesn't have an ounce of static grass on, on his layout. No, but. and he's actually he's actually seen these pictures and he's now looking into these products. Yeah, okay, lovely. I yeah. just think it's <laughs> – for the scenery point of view, it's pretty well what DCC has brought to the operation of the trains. It's just the next level technology. Um, and, you know, I've tried making some of these thistle brushes and all that type of thing, and there are you can do it. Um, but, you know, they're t- quite time-consuming to do it. But sure. you know, they, they definitely don't come up. I've, I make little, like, little bulrush type um, with static grass and some longer ones where you dip into sort of the yellowy flowers like you've got there. So... But, you know, how much time does that take to, to build those when you can you can buy them as well for a reasonable so you price? You take your tops, you put some glue down, take your static grass, go over it, different yeah. heights. I have a mess with that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So there's those lovely drums that we, we spoke about. Yeah. Nearly two, oh, two hours ago now. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah so... So when is this model being released? Or you don't know? As soon as I finish it. As soon as you finish it. So I need to get Um, you off it. (laughs) It was supposed to be ready by the end of May for Timonium show in Maryland. Oh, I see. Yeah. The shows aren't happening. Yeah. So I think he's planning on bringing it out, hopefully the October Timonium show. Right. Okay. Uh, So, yeah. I love that uh, that little oily rag there. That's just a nice little touch. So, how did you do that? Is that just a tissue or tissue paper or? Yeah, it's a uh, toilet paper. Toilet paper. Um, yeah, I had some left over. No. <laughs> um, it's toilet paper. I just coated with uh, the fifty fifty water yeah. glue. Yeah. Uh, crinkled it up, put it sure. on just a piece of cardstock, and let it dry, and then painted it. Right. That idea that idea came from a buddy of mine, Frank Bernard, who's a phenomenal model builder also. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, that was his idea. Yeah, that's just lovely. Yeah. That wouldn't be that hard to do. Just tear a corner off uh, a HO version either. So yep. just scrinkle up a little bit more. So. Yeah. So how do you go about doing your signs? So all these signs – came from Frank Bernard. Right. He did a lot of signs on George's layout. Right. Uh, for George okay. Yeah. Kids. Um, but he sent me, I don't know, 40 sheets of signs in HO and O scale. I oh, just wow. cut them out, yeah. cut them out, um, take 400 grit sandpaper yeah. and just strike it down. Yeah. That brings the color down. Sure. Uh, and then I'll take oils. And I'll weather them with oils. Right. And then just go back um, either with pan pastels on the edges to make it look rusty or 
yeah. a Sharpie pen, you know, or just some acrylic paint, cheap sure. paint with a paintbrush. Yeah. So you obviously stuck that to some card stock or something similar. I used, to it. I used card stock, yeah. Yeah, okay. You know, it's funny because when I did this, uh, Mark from I, Mark from Foggy Mountain, I sent him the pictures. He's like, I don't think science would really be there. And I got so many compliment, comments on the post that, those signs just add so much to it. It's yeah. another one of those things that it probably wouldn't be there. Yeah. But but it adds to the scene. I think so. Um, it'd be interesting if you took that same photo that we've got up now, if you took that sign away, I think it just adds that that connection just, between yeah. the, the ground cover and the yes. side of, of that, that structure. Um, it all. Yeah, just just links. It's just a little bit more coloring. Um, yep. I think you called it when you didn't do the corrugated iron roofing. I think you were correct. That would have been too much. That's yep. in Australia. We have a lot of buildings that are just all corrugated iron. Yep. So it might work over here if you're doing it. So an outback scene, I suppose. But depending on what locale you want this at. But I think that sign just. It was either going to be signs or you had to put something else there, some other detail part. I don't think you could have, and I don't think you would have got away with ground cover either. It's just, I don't know, it's just, it's hard to explain, but um, yeah. I think the signs hit hit the nail. That, so, yeah, good work. You see how the corrugated aluminum looks different than just brushing it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's with the acid. Right, okay. So yeah, okay, just in the middle there. Yeah. Yeah. So the technique I used on that is I cut the pieces and I split them into three categories. Yeah. Um, the first category was not painted at all, not primed. Yeah. Then the next category was some, was primed with gray rattle cam paint. Right. The next one was primed with the, the gray and then yep. uh, sponged with acrylic paints right there and then i dipped them all into that solution and it yeah. weathered them to that variation oh okay so what sort of acid are you using radio shack i don't know if you have radio shack over there yeah heard of we it? don't have radio shack but we got a similar type of electronic store yeah it's an acid for uh making computer boards or uh, making circuit boards okay yeah, yeah i know the stuff for- so it's very dangerous. Yeah. Um, George used to recommend it in his kits back in the day. Yeah. So basically you dip the piece in, yeah. the acid eats it, and you got to pull it out quick. Right. Or it will just disintegrate. Right, the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. So I just kept it in different times, and then you dip it in cold water, and yeah. That would but be I interesting if you were making a very dilapidated old shed. What? <laughs> Different, leaving it in for different times and see what it actually yep. looks like. Not obviously that's yep. not suiting this type of model, but see what that would look like. Yep. So, oh, very good. So, all right. Is there any anything more you wanna you wanted to uh, bring up about that that model? So, so we've just ticked over well, two hours and ten minutes. So yeah. that's been no, fantastic. Yeah, so, that's been it's been detailed. At bit at yes. worst. <laughs> so, I suppose we'll we'll wrap up there. Um, okay. I'm sure more times in the future, I've, I've got a feeling that you and I, if if you're willing, um, to catch up again, just to touch base and yeah, maybe even do a a semi live type clinic. How you doing? Something or something similar? Uh, work something out. So, so we will wrap up up there, as I said. So, I suppose to recap on. You know, it's been a lovely discussion. As I said, over two hours and eleven minutes. It does. It's felt like thirty minutes to be, for me anyway. Yeah. Um, what I've taken out of chatting to you and your experiences is practice, 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 practice on some scrap pieces of medium, whatever you're using, whether it's the corrugated iron like you got there, um, whether it's clapboard, uh, board and batten, or anything in between. Um, 
just keep practicing. Try the new mediums. Don't don't be scared of them, so to speak. Get on board and have a look at some of your um, Facebook to see how you've done it. But I think the big thing by doing that, you, you, what I'm getting from what you're saying is you're learning the capabilities of each of these individual products and then how to how to then use them on your models proper. If that's yep. that's what I'm sort of taking out of the discussion we've had today. So. Yeah, I mean, I have all the AK products, but I don't know how to use them all. Yeah. So I'm always trying them out, practicing. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, and don't be afraid to reach out to people. If you see something, send them a message on Facebook. Yeah, ask, definitely. That's a good question. Anyway, Craig, thank you so much for spending so much of your Saturday evening with me. Uh, as I said, it's it's blown my mind, um, and I've busily been writing notes down here and various new techniques I want to try, and I will be listening back again to get others. Um, so I thoroughly enjoyed chatting with that's you. Fine. Um, fine. And Appreciate it has been, time. yeah, no, it's been fantastic. So. We'll stop the recording there. So I thank you very much again. So we'll see you next. Make sure you subscribe. Click that little bell icon to be notified of upcoming videos. Support us on Patreon. Like us on Facebook and Instagram at Model Railroad Techniques.